Hi, in this episode I'll be talking to my friend and fellow diver, Scuba Grace Westgar. She's a girl I met through the Go Dive 2020 show in February. Over a brew, she'll be discussing her interest in underwater videography, public speaking with the girls at Scuba, and training as a scuba diver. How diving as a young teenager and some of the backlash she faced. Fancy a brew? Scuba Grace has been training since the age of 10, and now at 17 she's been published in magazines, given public talks and recently taken to side mount diving as well as raising money for the Age UK charity. Grab yourself a brew, sit back and enjoy. <laughs> so, obviously I came across you initially on the BSAC um, Scuba magazine where I'd seen you've been training with the guy who I always looked up to uh, when I first started diving because I saw one of his videos on YouTube of him cracking SMB out and he was like <laughs> perfectly... Like he looked like he was laid on a glass coffee table at 20 meters yeah, because he didn't move. So I looked at him and I went, I need to be more like him. Then I found out he lived around the corner from my house. <laughs> and then he dives at the place that I learned to dive. So we, mm -hmm. so obviously we had that sort of mutual acquaintance. Then I saw you at the dive show in February, was it uh, March? Yeah, the yeah. Go Dive in 2020 with girls at Scuba. And then through another mutual acquaintance. So Ian Last, who is my um, second guest on here, um, I came across you through his scuba, big scuba podcast. Big shout out to Ian. And Gemma, don't, I, can't, I can't be leaving Gemma out, oh my God. <laughs> um, and then through Vicky, she talked a lot more about girls at scuba. So you are an obvious candidate, so tell us a bit more that I wouldn't know about you. <laughs> um, well, I mean, so I'm still at college, obviously. I am... Um do film and television at college. So I definitely know what you're talking about with the videos earlier. It's very hard. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that a lot. Um, but yeah, I mean, I like, I still, compared to a lot of people who've been diving seven years, I actually haven't got that many dives compared to a lot of people. Hmm. Um, Cause mainly the dives that I do um, regularly are in the pool or um, just, I mean, <laughs> I do a lot of being um, dead bodies for rescue horses. I just like laying on the bottom, not doing yeah. anything really. <laughs> hey. um, but yeah, I mean, hopefully by next January, um, or no, I'll start in January, I'll be a dive master. So that's what I'm working on at right. the moment. Um, which is quite exciting because <laughs> I got my master or junior master's diver when I was 13. Right. Um, so... I've had to wait since then. I've done like specialities and stuff in between. Yeah. But I've had to wait since then. That was the last major course I did. So that was in 2016. Um, so yeah, it's been quite a long wait up to the dive master and I'm ready for it now. <laughs> mm -hmm. So let's take you back a little bit. So you, you've, you've clearly been in the army cadets with the princess of Wales's Royal Regiment. I, I noticed that. <laughs> yes, uh, I was. Yeah. It might surprise you that I kind of recognize your cat badge straight away. I wasn't PWRR, but I've been in the army uh, for about 15 years. So when I did my basic training, it was in an infantry establishment mm -hmm. and we were uh, cohabited with the PW, a lot of PWRR. So did you find that going through the army cadets that instilled in you a resilience that will probably take you through for the rest of your life? Yeah, I mean, I actually... <laughs> kind of, it does link to diving a lot because I found um, my army cadet attachment through someone who I used to dive with. Right. Um, so at one of the old clubs that I was with, there was a guy there and he said he was a DC at a detachment and I was like, okay, uh, that looks fun, I'll give it a go. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up doing it for, I think it was about three years, I'm not sure now. Um, yeah. But yeah, it definitely, though, I had a lot of good experiences and I always think back to the camps and stuff as like, they were such good fun. Um, and it definitely taught me, it did teach me a lot. Um, I never really think of it um, too much now because it was quite a long time ago, but just basic things like <laughs> always being on time and it's like a huge thing. Yeah. And although it was the cadets and everyone says like, oh, it's not, obviously it's not like being in the actual army or whatever. No. It still teaches you a lot of basic life lessons that you wouldn't well, learn just, anywhere Just else. like your own personal administration, isn't it? You know, yeah, exactly. shower once a day, do your teeth, cut your nails, mm. make sure your feet are kept clean so they don't fall yeah. off. <laughs> and it's like, I learned how to iron because of cadets. I'd never ironed my clothes before. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, so, yeah. I, what mm. life lessons I learned and then saw other people learning, it was shocked people turning up and didn't know how to iron or 
we had to show people how to wash and cut the nails because they were just chewing them off. And I'm like, yeah, this is fundamental. I've been taught this since a kid. How do these grown men not or women not yeah, even no. know? But mm. it, it, I think not so much a national service, but certainly for school leavers, the way now you either have to do a traineeship or go to college. You know, mm -hmm. you can't just go and get a job as such. Yeah. I think two years, not so much as a cadet, but some in some way like a reserve, I think mm. it'd be phenomenal for a lot of the community because it, it instills values like that family camaraderie that a lot of people don't mm. have and are not brought up with. Um, yeah. I, I can't speak highly enough of it. I mean, it's hard, but I, I remember more good times than I do bad it's always cold, it's always wet, and it's always raining. But it's yeah. always fun. No matter what, as soon as you get home, you go, how good was that? So I, Yeah, I, I just I remember always... Me. Yeah, I mean, that's a great idea. I, I, I always um, remember kind of dreading the camps almost because yeah. like, I knew that it was going to be cold and hard work, and I knew that we were going to get shouted at. But <laughs> I would always like come home and just be like, yeah, that, <laughs> I'm glad I did it. I was mm. never like regretful that I went on a camp. Like even when we were doing, we had like a shooting camp um, a few days, and it was like snowing hard, and we were just having to like lay on the floor for yeah like, ranges out of pit, aren't they? Yeah, and um, but I still, I yeah, I still enjoyed it. Mm. Nice one. So you got into diving before you cadets then. What was yeah. what was what was that the, the the lead into that for you? What made you go start? Um, well, my <laughs> my I learned with my dad in Egypt um right. because he'd always wanted to do it I think he'd done like one dry dive before right um and when he saw that I was 10 and he found out when we were on holiday that you had to be 10 years old to do it I think he kind of used it as his excuse to do it Ace. um yeah. and he said like do you want to do it and I had to go in the pool um and yeah I was like oh that was pretty fun mm -hmm. um and then, yeah, so we did the open water course that week. Um, <laughs> I do remember having, I was like super confident in the water. I'd always snorkeled and whatever in the sea. But I just remember getting in the sea for the first time with all my kit on and I had a complete freak out. Um, I was like, Dad, don't, I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> you go and do it yourself. I don't yeah. need to do it. Um, but as soon as the instructor like got me under the water, that was it. What, co fine. what caused that freak out? Was it the, the vast, as you look down, that vast expanse of water around you? Do you think? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm not really sure because I'd always snorkeled in that bit for ages. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I'm one of them people, like, if I put a snorkel on, I'll try and like. Duck dive down, down as far as you can, yeah. Um, yeah. And like, I, I know I've been doing that before. Um, mm -hmm. But I think maybe it was just because of the, the kit. I was tiny and like the kit was so yeah. big on me. Um, bit scared that I didn't know exactly what I was doing. Like, I know right. I've read all the stuff, but there was still a bit of doubt, like, what if, mm. I, what if something happens? Yeah, I get um, it. And I, I just remember the first few dives, I used to check my air gauge, like, literally every 20 seconds. Really? Just to make sure, and I'll, look, like, be checking with Dad, like, oh, my mm. gosh, <laughs> what's your air? Um, <laughs> and now I can go, like, you're not supposed to do, but, like, half a dive without checking it, and then only check it in the middle because mm. um, I'm used to how much I breathe now. But So on that note, yeah. what's your surface <laughs> interval? Right, so I couldn't find my dive computer because we're sorting out the garage yeah. and the house. <laughs> but I've got my logbook. Okay. And I looked and it was the 26th of January was my last dive. So that's longer than me. Yeah, wow. it is. It's been so long. So I remember that was only a few days after my birthday. And yeah. I thought, oh, that's... Um, Flipping heck. Getting me started for the year of diving well, mine, so many trips planned. mine is on 88 days devastated like almost three months i know well when i interviewed ian the other <laughs> week ian was like oh, he had a, another 100 days on top of whatever mine was so it's like <laughs> do, you, do you not dive through the winter oh no no it's too cold i'm like <laughs> it's when the best is. why are you not in the water yeah exactly yeah mm, i love cold cold mm. water diving it's great yeah, we, we've done a bit of snorkeling while we can. The, the, literally, the weekend it locked down, we went to a place up in mm -hmm. the Lake District. That was in not, that was phenomenal. It was so clear. Mm. And then I went last weekend where we found that shotgun. <laughs> that was quite fun. Oh, yeah. The, the mm. viz was awful. There was so much crap blowing off the trees. That, that <laughs> better than not getting wet, isn't it? And I don't live too well, near yeah, the coast. Exactly. So 
Mm. So what's your nearest dive site? Um, nearest is Raysbury, the muddy puddle. Right, yeah, I've <laughs> heard of that. It. It's, a bit like, it's a bit like Delph. Yeah. It's not that much different, just... Mm. It's good for training, good for yeah. practice. Speaking of Delft, um, what brought you up here then to to uh, to do your side mount training? Well, I mean, it was literally just because at the go diving show, not like this year, the year before. Yeah. Um, I met Gary, and I've been friends with him on Facebook for a while. Um, but I met him and just talking about side mount because I wanted to do it. Yeah. I knew I wanted to do it. Um, I also wanted to try raise. It really intrigued me, like the way they teach and stuff, and I. I like to try as many different agencies as I can. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just kind of sorted it out with him. And I don't think he realised that I live so far away. <laughs> so obviously I'm in London. Yeah. Um, and then we drove up there and we were like, oh, we've been driving since like two o'clock in the morning. He was like, right, what? <laughs> I tell you, but, I, I, obviously I've known of him for a, quite a while. I wanted to go with him because I heard he had a slightly different, he had a flair that was slightly different mm. to everybody else. And I wanted to learn yeah. to be as perfect or near perfect in the water. Now he's yeah. got he's got that good because he clearly does about a thousand dives a year, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. There's no question Definitely. that if you dive regularly and you understand what you're trying to do, you will get better. Oh, Whereas yeah. mm-hmm. you you can practice something to, to your heart's content, but if no one tells you you're doing it wrong, you're not going to get any better. So mm. I was. I was overwhelmed off my first day. I came home and my wife says to me, so I was that? I went, I'm not sure. Because <laughs> everything <laughs> I'd learned up to that point had just been tossed out the window and kind of yeah. jumbled up and then put back in my head. And I'm trying to think of everything in a totally different way. Which yeah, I, I was exactly the same. It yeah. made I absolute mean, sense, doesn't it? But Yeah, because everything he said is like, it's, he's fine-tuned his side mount gear to like the top level yeah. and even just things like he was saying about I had trouble with my fins because I always get floaty feet so I'd always thought right the heaviest fins will be the best because they'll weigh my feet down yeah. and he said actually no because you want neutrally buoyant fins because otherwise um, your dry suit will like more air will go into your legs which will lift them up because they're trying to compensate for the heavy yeah. fins so if you have neutrally buoyant ones, then it will just all even out. Mm. And I tried um, some different fins the next day, and it was like magic. Totally different. Yeah, yeah, it was so good. Yeah, that brings me very nicely then onto how did you find the no fins hover? <laughs> that um, <laughs> definitely, it was a struggle. Yeah, it was, it's like somebody's I mean, just well. sawed your legs off, isn't it? Oh, I don't want to. I never want to see that video. <laughs> no. Um, but yeah, I mean, did you do it over like the platform with like it kind of is like a greatest pa- yeah. platform? Um, I just remember like floating up and I tried to like grab onto the um platform and I didn't have gloves on, so I cut all my hands off as well. Well, <laughs> but, I had dry gloves on, so you can imagine every dive mm. you just got ripped to shreds on those. So I had a new pair of marigolds yeah. on and every dive, mm. <laughs> but, but as soon as you put them fins back on, you're like. Pfft. You're a ninja? Yeah. In a what? It's, it's like, why would you do How that? How does that work? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, my, a couple of weeks after that, I did him a favour. So he did one for me. Like I sorted his garden out at his house. That's what I do. And he took my <laughs> wife in for a day to try and sort her trim out. We're in a um, twin set. Right. I'll not bore you with the story, but he took her in. And one of the first things, again, get them fins off. Come on. <laughs> And then he took a mate of mine in, and again, get them fins off. <laughs> and yeah. Both of them come out the water going, why the frigging hell have we done that? <laughs> it, I think it's such a good training tool if you get to a level already. You can't just throw someone in the water and get the fins off and expect them to progress. You, yeah. They've got to be somewhere thereabouts already. But it, yeah. I found mm-hmm. it phenomenally hard. <laughs> I felt like an yes. idiot. Mm. I thought he'd be laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, me too. But it's a bit, a bit like Karate Kid in it, where Mr. Miyagi says, like, wax on, wax off. And you're like, why am I doing this? And then all of a sudden, you can fight, because you can wax on and wax off. Yeah. So that was good. <laughs> I've seen you doing a bit of surfing, whether it's a bodyboard or whatever. Is that, is that yeah. your bag, or is that just a one-off? Well, it was just a one-off, um, because some of my extended family live in Cornwall. And, oh, um, lucky, lucky but, people. 
Well, yeah, I've only been once. My mum used to go there all the time. And last year was my first time. And I can't lie, I've absolutely fallen in love with the place. Yeah. Um, and I'm now looking to go to university there next year. Wow. Which um, I think will be amazing because I want to learn to surf. Yeah. What uni is so that? Fun. Um, Falmouth. Right. Um, and actually the course that I want to do... Um, like they teach you to dive as part of it, so I'm already kind of a step ahead. Jeez. But it's like underwater photography and stuff, and I was like, that will be perfect if I can get into there. I'll yeah. tell you what, they say youth is wasted on the young, right? <laughs> but, but that said, there's, there's, there's a few of you out there that manage to just grasp it, and you've, you've got that plan. I only got a plan, really, about 10 years ago in my life, you know what I actually <laughs> wanted to do, and mm. I've wasted thirty years, really, haven't I? Of, or at least the last fifteen <laughs> of, of doing other things that perhaps I, I was kind of pushed into rather than I chose to do. And if I, I had my time again, I'd be doing exactly what you're doing now: filmmaking, yeah. diving, surfing. Move down southwest. I mean, yeah, I've seen it happen with so many people, like at my old school and whatever. They don't know what they want to do, mm. which not a lot of people do. I understand, yeah. um, and they just get like pushed into doing something like that they don't want to do yeah. just because they think it'll be a job whatever and it does happen to most people and it's kind of annoying um and i'm just very grateful that i've managed to find what i do hopefully want to do um for a very long time quite early on um and i know everyone says i'm very lucky <laughs> and, and i realize that i probably am i mean my dad only started diving when he was 45 i think yeah maybe so yeah you never know when you're going to find something like that no i mean that I've got children around your age. My, well, my eldest is 21, Megan, who normally works for me. And mm. she kind of, through anxieties and other things, she decided to come and work with me doing what we do. She's no mm -hmm. interest in that whatsoever. But again, she's, yeah. she's, not, she's nothing else other than going out of a weekend with all the mates, buying clothes, doing her hair and makeup and all that sort of jazz. Whereas I did have ideas of what I wanted to do, but I didn't know how I could bring them to fruition. You know, I didn't really mm. perhaps have the support to go to college. I had to get a job. Yeah, I don't understand people sometimes, honestly. Because it seems like, I feel like when you start, it's always quite wel welcoming. Everyone yeah. like, puts on a happy face and whatever. Um, I, I mean, I've, I've been lucky. Most clubs that I've been to have been great. Um, mm. But... <laughs> I've definitely, when I was younger, I had quite a bad experience with a club and it was not, the people were nice, put it that way. Yeah. Um, I won't go into it too much, but basically the guy that ran it <laughs> ended up getting expelled from Paddy and whatnot, um, wow. which is like, <laughs> I think he's the only one, so it'll be quite <laughs> um, easy to figure out if you want to figure out who it right. is. But, um, Flipping out. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he scammed a few people out of money and whatnot. And you just think it's like it's supposed to be a fun sport, right? Mm. And I'm sure that it happens in all industries and sports and whatnot. But yeah. it's just, I don't understand people's mindsets because it's such a, people class it as a dangerous sport, but it's not dangerous if you have the right training and whatever. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I don't get why people would want to mess with people in such a sport that's mm. related to being dangerous. You kind of mm. almost beat me to a question there. Have, have you come across <laughs> or come up, have you like hit any obstacles along your training path? Probably more related mm. to your age than anything I'd suggest. Because I certainly have, but I think it, I, the obstacles I hit were because I was keen. You know, I wanted to learn. Mm. It was one of the first things I've actually really wanted to learn and get in amongst, you know, so I wanted to progress. And there's people standing in the way for no other reason then they just don't want you to progress. And it's not because I'm dangerous. I might be a bit gun ho mm. in some of my attitude, but I can tell you now, I'm as safe a diver as anyone you know, because I don't mm. want to die or be linked to your yeah. death. So, mm -hmm. but I just don't get how people would step in your way. So have you come across that at all? Yeah, I mean, I think when I was, I, probably, I was probably only 11. Um, I used to help out at pool sessions, um, at a pool that was quite deep, actually. It was like five metres deep. And I remember I was with an instructor, so I was allowed to do this. And we went to the bottom and I showed a person who was doing a try dive, like it just demonstrated how to take a mask off and whatever. Yeah. Um, and when we came up, I just remember this guy saying to me, like, not even in a jokey way, like, am I safe to dive with her? Like to the instructor in front of my face. And I was like, you could have asked me for one. 
And um, for two, I, I mean, I didn't have a lot more experience than him because I've only been diving for a year, but I still like had done two courses by then. And I just like, that was kind of my first ever time where I remember being a bit like put off by that. Yeah. I remember telling my dad and being like, That's, <laughs> that was quite, I didn't like that at all. No. But apart from that, I haven't really had any interactions with people that have stopped me. Um, but I think just the, like when I started, I didn't, most divers don't know any better. Um, and like I did all of them courses in three years. And afterwards I look back and I think people probably thought that I was, well, you know, badge, co you... badge collecting they call it, didn't they? Yeah, basically, yeah. And to some extent, I kind of do wish I took it slower um, because people probably were looking at me like, she hasn't got that much experience and she's a master diver and whatever. But I, I, I don't, well, I kind of, I don't regret it, put it that way. Um, because that I know that I was capable of doing it. Whatever. Mm. But I feel like some people definitely would have thought that I was doing that and yeah. that maybe people were pushing me to do it, but I just wanted to get as far as I could, really. But very much like you, I sort of flew through the courses initially and then tried mm -hmm. to, over the last few years, just consolidate what I've learned and just yeah. go and enjoy mm -hmm. my diving rather than, mm. you know, I've hit a level now, I don't really need to exceed, you know, when we yeah. talked earlier about rebreathers and technical diving, I don't have the, the means, you know, Eki Delph, <laughs> 19 meters yeah. at a push, <laughs> 19 millimeters yeah. at a push. <laughs> um, and, yeah. you know, my wife, she's only a sport diver, so she doesn't, she's not interested in putting a load of different gases on. We're not going cave diving anywhere around here. So that's, yeah. why, that's why I bought a camera, you know, get in the water and, enjoy my diving, taking pictures of my wife or she can take them of me or whoever we're with and, and learn some more about the marine life now rather than just miss it all because too busy <laughs> nailing it past. Mm. So do you have a camera? Do you do, do, you do it for underwater photography? Yeah, well, I mean, considering that's what I want to get into, I'm, I've got a very basic camera set up. Um, right. I've, I've got a Nikon, I think it's a W300, and it like is one of the ones that you don't need a housing for. It's like 40 metres, whatever. Cool. Um, saying that, <laughs> oh no, it's 30 metres. Right. And now that I'm, um, I can go to 40 and I remember we went to like 32 metres or whatever on one dive. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I came back up and it was broke and that happened twice. So Devastated. It's a, it's a good camera for the price, I suppose. Um, and like, it's not really a faff because you don't have the housing and whatever. Yeah. And you can still put like um, a tray on it with lights and whatnot. But mm. um, yeah, <laughs> I definitely need to invest it's on my list to get a I suppose camera. as a student unless your mum and dad are earning mega bucks and they're handing that over to you exactly it's so hard isn't it to to get into things honestly it's um yeah that's i think that's been the main problem like all of my um kit especially when i was younger like i was still growing yeah so um i had to have all secondhand kit um stuff that didn't fit me properly for a very long time <laughs> and it's now that i've stopped growing that i've actually been able to like invest in a few things that yeah. i've saved up for i bet you were um, changing uh dry suits in between dives from one to a bigger one <laughs> if you're growing <laughs> that much <laughs> well i mean my dry suit that i um like had a loan from the club like they gave it to me for a while yeah <laughs> that dry suit it was like it was the smallest one they had and it was like a meter too long on my legs for me <laughs> it was so long and i just remember like all the time like I'll get air in my feet and the feet would just pop off Yeah. with my fins on. So like I wouldn't be able to go anywhere and we'd just have to stop the dive and come back up again. Um, so yeah, that was definitely the first investment was a dry suit. Um, yeah. But the next one is definitely a camera, a good camera. Nice one. Good luck with that. So uh, I have, I have stalked you a little bit on Facebook just to, I've got to learn a little <laughs> bit about it. And I can't just interview well, you. Yeah, no, no, exactly. you. You do all talking. <laughs> So, <laughs> the Tiger King, have you watched it? Oh, yes. Yes, I love it. I love it. It was such a good documentary. Did mm. you see all the TikTok videos about a week after? And it was all <laughs> the Carol Baskin ones. Yeah. Yeah, I love wow. them. Yeah. I mean, I'm not into TikTok, I'll be honest. It's not Michael with I'm probably a little bit out of the age bracket that it's projected <laughs> for. But when it come on, I was like, right, next, <laughs> next. And it was just... Yeah. But what a story that is. They're just nuts, yeah. aren't they? It is crazy. It's really like I don't understand that lifestyle at all. It's completely different to anything anyone in the UK lives like. 
<laughs> I don't understand. I've often said, though, you know, talking to different people I've interviewed on here, or even before, mm-hmm. you know, we dive with sharks quite a bit now. And touch wood, we've not had any issues. And we're quite mm. well versed in how where we should be in a water column and how we should behave. But I've always said, well, you couldn't go into the middle of Africa where lions and that are cutting about, could you? Because they'd just come and take your head off. But then you watch Tiger King and they're all just sat there cuddling and yeah, they're, messing they're just, around. Yeah. They've been so well domesticated by people, it's crazy. It's horrible though, isn't yeah. it? The numbers they've got in there. Wow. I, yeah, I didn't have any idea what the extent was to it. No. Um, and actually after watching the, the Tiger King, um, I watched the Louis Theroux documentary because he did one before, like literally I think it was the year I was born and he made it. Right. Um, and it has Joe Exotic in it as well. Does it? I've not seen um, that. Yeah. Um, I think it's on iPlayer because they showed it. They've okay. obviously seen the hype that Tiger King's got, and then they showed it again recently yeah. on TV. But um, that was really interesting as well because mm. he doesn't really show the um, like their lifestyles and stuff. He kind of just tells you all the facts about the actual animals yeah. and whatever. And it is some of it's so horrible, but yeah, we, st- we started watching it and probably f- well into the third episode, still didn't realise what it was. You know, we just thought it was a <laughs> genuine documentary. It wasn't like. Mm look at these idiots and we didn't realise there was all the drugs and all this sort of stuff involved and then we yeah. sat at the end just like that oh my god yeah, what? <laughs> <laughs> speaking yeah. of that though have you watched um, Blackfish yeah mm-hmm. about SeaWorld see we, yeah. we'd been there the year before that came out and and, really? and and honestly if I'd have known all that went on I would have never gone well yeah that's the thing I mean like we um, when I was younger we used to go to a I think I went to two or three maybe like shows, you know, like when you go on holiday and whatever, they always advertise these tourist shows with dolphins and whatnot. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I think we went to a couple um, and just like after being educated on the topic, like I would never ever go back to anywhere like that. And I remember after watching Blackfish um, literally like a week later, my school, uh, my old school, well, it was on an exchange to Spain and they went to the same um, place that was in Blackfish. That Laura <laughs> Park, yeah. Wrote... In Tenerife, isn't it? Laura Park. Yeah, yeah, I've been there. Yeah. And I just remember writing an email, like, quite angry at them, like, <laughs> don't ever take them on a trip there again. Mm. Um, but it was, it's quite annoying to see, like, I mean, it's a good thing that people are being ed- educated and I think a lot more people understand mm. now, especially people my age, because it's on Netflix and whatever. So yeah. I know a lot of people watched it. But it is annoying still to see that some people, it hasn't got into their heads yet. You see, I find on some of the Facebook groups that we're probably all on, mm. that are scuba diving specific, not spear fishing, not fishing, actual scuba yeah. diving ones, you still see, see people bringing out these big fish. And I'm like, it's got no mm. place on, because scuba divers that I'm aware of, we're all conservationists now, aren't we? Nobody touches yeah. anything. In fact, I looked at one yesterday, and you know, um, a pencil urchin or a pencil and enemy, I forget what they, I think it's a pencil urchin. Some yeah. guy had got one of them, brought it halfway up, sort of chucked it in the water so he could get a picture of it. And then he says, Don't worry, I caught it and put it back nicely where I found it. The, honestly, <laughs> he, and, and quite rightly, he got rinsed for that. You know, yeah. what the mm-hmm. flipping heck? Which part of? Look and don't touch where you're not taught. So I've seen you've just you've just been studying your lifeguard award online. <laughs> yeah. So how's mm-hmm. that going? Is that all right? Yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, it's interesting for everyone really because it's the first course that they've ever had to do online, and yeah. considering it's quite a theory-based thing, um, it's quite difficult. But um, I actually really enjoy all the first aid stuff. Like I've done first aid countless times now because I've obviously dive in and then cadets and now this. Um, but yeah, I, I really enjoy it. And also it's like the the guy who's running it has so much experience with stuff. And when I told him that he I do diving and whatever, he's also a diver. Yeah. Um so yeah, it's really the lockdown has made me do quite a lot of things that I probably wouldn't have done before. Mm. Um, like this course and I'm just doing lots of free diving courses that everyone's advertising at the moment. Yeah. It's just anything that I can do really. Um, I think there's, yeah. there's a, I seem to be having that conversation more and more with whoever I'm having a conversation with that how much life has changed and probably mm. will change in many respects for the better. Yeah. You know, to, mm-hmm. to do stuff like this, there's no way on planet Earth if lockdown have happened, me and you would be chatting. You know, no. so mm-hmm. just 
growing your own network of friends and people you can question for something ever it's, it's expanded mm. i'm chatting to a guy like i said in new zealand one in mozambique the other day then i've got mm. um fernando that's over in lagomera one of the canary islands it's brill and yeah like you said learning courses that you might not have bothered doing because you just wouldn't have had time but now you've got time so let's get it smashed in do it it's great yeah it? i mean we're just i suppose we're very lucky that we have all of these things like zoom and whatever because if we didn't it would be very very different i suppose yeah. and i wouldn't have done half the stuff i've done like i mean as well i suppose it's also good for people like you doing podcasts and mm. like the big scoop podcast and whatever because it would have taken so much organizing to get like people from different places all together at the same time but now we can just do it so easily so it's a very good thing as well um <laughs> with the filming side of it as well I also used to take like literally if I needed to film like a two minute thing it would probably take me at least all morning to get set up for it um just because I didn't really like being on camera a few weeks ago oh it's horrible like, yeah it is it's really and like watching myself back like even the big scuba podcast I'm admitting something here that <laughs> probably isn't a good thing but I haven't listened to that back because I don't really like listening to myself talk but um yeah, it's definitely like it's actually. I think it's improved my confidence a lot more because I'm making myself do things, yeah, like sitting on camera and like with schoolwork because I go to a film school, so obviously they're going to have to make us do filming at home with our iPads and stuff. Um, yeah, and I have worked out, like you said, like I've worked out a way that works for me, um, editing wise as well. That's just so much easier than what I was doing mm -hmm. before, but I just never had time to. What's your, what, myself. what is your preference? Is it being in front of or behind the camera? Or a bit of both? Definitely behind. <laughs> I think definitely behind. Um, I Anything to do with like public speaking, whatever. Like I did the thing at the Go Down show um, yeah. in February. And I never say no to anything because I feel like I let myself down if I do that. But yeah. um, I knew it was going to be filmed and stuff. And I just knew that I wasn't going to watch it afterwards. But I was... Mm. Yeah, so I always just make myself do it, and then it, it normally goes okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I, I can relate massively to that, because for whatever reason I started this, you know, people telling me, oh, Andy, you're, you're dead enthusiastic about it, you're always talking about it, and blah, 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 you should do this. Mm -hmm. I kind of thought, well, I've nothing to lose, have I? But the minute mm -hmm. that camera, I pressed record, I was like, shrinking violet. I didn't know what to say. <laughs> I was dead nervous. Yeah. Honestly, my sort of episode one I've, I've took it down three times and refilmed it honestly mm -hmm. it was it was mm -hmm. horrendous and still to this day i'm not so bad in my garage or in my i'm in my uh, dining room now but if i go and do one of my fitness videos in the garden and he can hear my next door neighbor even if he's sat on yeah. the phone he's not he's, he's in his 70s he's not listening doesn't care what i'm doing he actually yeah. watches and likes what i do but if i hear him i'm starting whispering into the microphone then and i'm like yeah you can't do it i do that I'm, with <laughs> Then your head when goes. my mum and dad are in, yeah, well, like I don't like my mum and dad hearing me like talk on camera and stuff. I just find it so weird for some reason. I just try and like I make sure that I go upstairs, I shut my door, and like I don't let anyone hear what I'm doing. And I normally have to write like a script out of what I'm gonna say, but I never normally actually use the script. Wow, <laughs> honestly, it's so refreshing, honestly, to talk to you, Grace, because nobody I know does this and feels the same way as I do. So knowing that you do. <laughs> Actually, it's quite. I, I know I'm just not the only idiot out there that just can't oh, deal you're with stuff. Not. <laughs> but I, to the point when I'm editing, I have to put my headphones in and I, I can't let her listen to. She might be cooking our dinner or something or faffing around in here. She mm. can't hear it because pff, nothing will happen. <laughs> the world's not going to explode, <laughs> but I can't let her hear it. It's terrible. Yeah. No, I get <laughs> Excuse that. me. So it is a nightmare. So anyway, right, <clears throat> I've had two of these and you've clearly just had one and I hated having a skinhead. How did you find it? <laughs> so, right, I actually really loved it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> until I made the very bad decision yesterday to try and give myself a mohawk. And wow. that is why I'm wearing the hat and nice. you are not seeing it. Okay. <laughs> I haven't even showed it to my mum and dad because I thought, like, my hair was growing out and I kind of, like... <sighs> Because we can't go to the barbers or the hairdressers yeah. or whatever. I just thought, you know what, I'll cut it myself. <laughs> and yes. I went a bit too far. Um, so I'm definitely, I'm just going to grow it back out and keep yeah. it short, to be honest. Mm. I, I hated it, I'll be honest. I absolutely, really? I don't, 
I, I struggle looking in a mirror, but I believe me. So why I took up, let's get on camera when I flip it and look at myself, that's the first mm -hmm. problem. But then my head just took on this whole different shape. Soon as I had this <laughs> tennis ball head, and honestly, I look like yeah. a tennis ball. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, like from the front, my head looks fine. <laughs> yeah. But if you look at my head from the back, I have such a weird head shape that I didn't yeah. had before I shaved it all off. But, wow. Mm. I, uh, I can't remember. I, I know I've had two in my life. And one was when I first joined the army. They said, make sure you turn up with short hair. So I thought, mm. I'll have it quite short on the top. Be all right, that. Mm. And then I'll go number one, back and sides. I'll take it really high. That'll be, be gleaming, that. Got there. They went, all that needs to go, lad. Get to the barbers. <laughs> and then, mm. some other reason, I can't even explain why, because I knew how much of a spazzer I looked. I then decided to have one just for a laugh a few years later and went, you look like a tit. Why have you had that? Why did you do that? <laughs> but obviously, yeah. you've done yours for a reason. So kudos to you. Do you want to talk a little bit about your charity work? <laughs> Very good cause, well, Age UK. I mean, well, yeah, I just wanted to do it. Um, I wanted to do it for a while. It wasn't actually because of the lockdown, which a few people think it was. But I mean, I suppose it was probably a good thing because all the charities are struggling at the moment. Yeah. Whatever. Um, but yeah, I thought if I'm going to do it, I might as well do it for a good cause. And I mean, my my nan is in a care home, so my nan's quite old. Um, she's got dementia. Uh, my granddad had dementia. He passed away in December, so it's quite a like. Ugh, a thing that I've wanted to do since then. Yeah. Um, it's kind of meant a bit more to me and my family. So, yeah, it's definitely something that I've wanted to do for a while and I'm glad I did it. <laughs> well, I think Age UK are a, are a cracking cause and I do know a little bit about them, to be honest. So they mm. used to supply me with quite a bit of work because more for the vulnerable people that are old. Mm. So they used mm -hmm. to have like a call centre where an old person would ring them up and say, hi, uh, we're looking for a gardener. Who would you recommend? So the, the, mm. the council that I'm with, as in the, 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 the town I live in, has a good mm -hmm. trader scheme, part of like trading standards, that latches, the age UK sort of latch onto the database of people like me. And obviously if we've mm. got a good review, they'll pass it on. And I had a mega review, uh, a mega sort of working relationship with them, knew them all by first names, <laughs> I'd tip up at Christmas with a tin of biscuits for all them in the call centre, because they're all volunteers, you know. So, yeah. mm. And then, because of budget cuts and funding and all the rest of it, they called that on, they knocked it on the head. Now, how much of a shame is that for all them old people that yeah, do get ripped really off? Mm. They not get any, because obviously, the, I think charities are quite fashionable, do you not agree? You know, like, mm. when, when we were all out mm -hmm. in Afghanistan 10 years ago in Iraq, everyone wanted to help, help for heroes, didn't they? Because all, yeah, all lads were, and yeah. girls were coming back with no legs and all the rest of it. And then mm -hmm. cancer, you, uh, cancer research and all that's research. had a big thing and, yeah. and so on and so forth. It, it kind of goes in circles. And before, you know, mm -hmm. it, Age UK are not longer any, uh, are not cooler anymore. And then yeah. cancer research falls on the way to the wayside a little bit. And then it's children in need all of a sudden. So yeah. mm. I think it's a cracking cause you've done it for. I have sponsored you today. I didn't realise you'd done it for that, so I've sponsored you today. I, I actually oh, have, no. I promise you. Um, <laughs> thank so, you so well much. done for that. Oh, um, thank you. That's all right. So, <laughs> finally then, let's talk about girls at Scuba. So, if you can yeah. tell me a little mm -hmm. bit, obviously, about who they are, what they do, and, and what your actual involvement in them is, rather than just being a, a Facebook group member as such. Yeah, I mean, well, I've... I joined Girls at Scuba when it was quite small um, because I was friends with Sarah Richards who runs it on um, Facebook yeah. and I saw that she was posting about it that she started this new group and whatever so I thought I might as well join. Um, so right from the beginning I've been posting on it and whatever um, and it's just really a good place for all women um, to go on and just not be afraid of posting anything. They can literally post whatever they like really as long as it's not advertising or whatever yeah, or stupid but um, yeah, it's, I think it is what she's doing is a really good thing. And I only met her, I'd never met her before. And I just recently met her in February at the Go Diving show. Yeah. Um, and I really do think that she's doing such a good job um, doing everything. And now she's got a, um, a plastic free shop and whatever. So they're doing the conservation side of it as well, right. not just the social side of it. And yeah, I, I mean, I just like helping them out. Yeah. Um, I don't really. I mean, obviously, I get exposure from, like, doing that talk in February or whatever, like, 
so some new people find out who I am and whatever. But I just think that she's doing such a good job. And yeah, that's I, I don't really have any other involvement apart from that. So I just how, did, how did you get asked to do the, the talk for them? Well, basically it was because she was doing um, two talks and she needed six people. And because I'd spoken to her quite a few times before on Facebook and yeah. Mark, who runs the Go Diving show, he found out that I was going because I went, I've been every year since it started. Um, and he knows me quite well now. Um, and he told her that I was going and then she messaged me on Facebook, just like, do you want to do this? Are you up for it? Right. Um, <laughs> and obviously yeah, I was quite nervous, but I said, yeah. And it went well. I think those kind of talks can be quite hard when they're not... Like, you see the other people, the other speakers that go on that are regular speakers, they're quite yeah. rehearsed in what they're going to say. You kind of, you kind of, like, given quick-fire questions, weren't you? Like, someone had just thought mm -hmm. of it off the top of their head, and you kind of like, oh, let me think. Pass us the mic, <laughs> it's my turn. And not that it was bad, Don't, don't please don't think that. It's oh, no, no. It must be quite intimidating and hard it to be was. up there. And we were like <laughs> right after Steve Batchel. Yeah. Which <laughs> I've been watching Steve Batchel literally like he was my age group. Like that Deadly was my 60 TV and that I watched them. before school. Yeah, I watched yeah. that before school like every morning. Yeah. And suddenly I'm like on a stage speaking right after him. All my friends were like, oh my God, how are you doing that? Yeah, it was pretty nerve wracking, but um, just try and <laughs> yeah, I just had to try and act confident. But mm -hmm. mm. well, you did. You come across really well, to be fair. But like I said, I I would have found that extremely intimidating because in some respects you don't know what's coming. I mean, unless you did, unless they said, right, we're going to ask you X, Y, and Z. Oh and no. It, <laughs> so for me, it was literally just like. She asked the questions. We didn't know what was coming. Like, wow. just had to think of an answer. But it was good that I was on um, with. I wouldn't have been able to do it on my own. Definitely no. not. Like, I was so glad that I had two other people with me. And those yeah. those girls are great as well. They're so interesting. So, mm. yeah, it was quite good to be with them. So, what's your interaction been on Facebook then? Have you had any sort of negative feedback? Because it seems to me, as soon as you mm -hmm. put your scuba kit on and start taking photographs of that, there's division straight away. You're not a tech diver, or your cylinders are out of trim, or your uh. feet are up, or your feet are down. You're wearing mm. the wrong fins. I don't give a monkey's what fins you wear. I mean, to be honest, <laughs> I haven't dived in split fins and I haven't dived in them force fins, you know, like mermen's feet or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I've never, and I heard people getting rinsing for that all the time, but I haven't dived them, so I don't know. So why should I have an yeah. opinion? Yeah, it's very true. I mean, there's so many things like that now. Um, and it does come back to the whole, I mean, I'm not saying that all men in the diving world are. <laughs> like that on Facebook groups. No. But I think it's just because the majority of divers at the moment are still men. Yeah. So there's just more of a likelihood of it being men who yeah. comment these things or whatever. Um, but yeah, honestly, I remember putting up a post like most divers do once they're past like their open water or whatever. Yeah. On just a random Facebook group. Um, and I mentioned that I was 10 because I was proud of it, you know? Yeah. And I there were so many comments like and my dad was getting into arguments with people in the comments because really? they were saying oh how did your dad let you do it so young or whatever you're not supposed to be diving or i was like <laughs> come on like i mean all all um agencies i think the limit is 10 now and you couldn't mm. even start diving in a pool at eight and i think it all depends on the person obviously some 10 year olds are more mature than others but absolutely yeah, yeah i just it was not a nice experience to come into it with but no mm. people normally don't say it face to face to you though well that's the thing Which, are you more inclined or less inclined to have a chat with someone at the at the dive site that you don't know you know just try and instill uh, sorry try and start a conversation with them about whatever they're doing to get some info, or would yeah, you just I mean, would you just go? No, I'm not talking to them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's difficult because um, most of the time I'm with like my club or something anyway. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I don't mind like talking to all of them, um, like new people that join our club. I'm quite yeah. happy to talk to because um, at the end of the day, I know that um, I'm not trying to sound cocky or anything. No. But if they're if they're just an open water student, I know that I've been diving for quite a while longer than them so I don't mind like having a chat with them or yeah. whatever but yeah I when you see all the people with the big like rebreathers and stuff it's 
I, I do, I, I wouldn't say I get intimidated, but I kind of think, because I, I do want to try all of that in the future, and I kind of look yeah. at it like, whoa, they're clearly so much better than me and whatever. And even underwater, like, when, <laughs> when um, you swim past them, I always realise that when I see them looking at me, or there's like a group of them near, I kind of like automatically try and look really cool and like, yeah. have my trim. <laughs> I'm exactly the same, yeah. Yeah. And quite um, often, do you not know find, quite often, they're no better than you in the water. Quite often they're out of trim, mm. the feet might be down yeah. and they're still thinning along and they've just, yeah, they've, I, just, they've just got a load more money spur than you to go and buy a rebreather. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, at the end of the day, like they might have a rebreather, but they probably haven't been diving it that long anyway. So. Yeah, possibly, isn't it? Yeah, you never know. Mm. So what's, what's next on the cards for you then? <sighs> well, I mean, this year is kind of like, we had loads of dive trips planned and whatever, um, but we're just kind of trying to see what we can book for later on in the year now because all of them have been cancelled um yeah lots of places that i haven't been to um that i was looking forward to going to but that's not happening so i think really the next thing is just dive master next yeah. year and then after that i want to um go to uni and then do the rolex scholarship which um may did as well yeah which the rolex scholarship just sounds incredible like you just get to travel and dive for a whole year so yeah that's with with heavily <laughs> influential people as well it'd be so good yeah though. yeah i can't i didn't really know a lot about it before february and yeah. now i've kind of because i was planning to just leave college and go straight into work yeah. um <laughs> but now i've kind of had to because you have to go to university to get into the Rolex thing. Yeah. So I've been looking at courses and yeah, I found, I've definitely found the one I want to do. So that's just fingers mm. crossed that I managed to get in. <laughs> it is. So yeah. um, with, with your filmmaking, this, this, is, this is totally kind of off what I'd planned to ask you and, and whether it goes in or not, we'll see. But with your filmmaking, what kind of inspires you to, to do stuff? I, I ask everybody this because not being a professional or even a trained photographer, I've got an understanding, obviously, and I've done a small course that was like half a day, loads of reading. Mm. But most photographers or videographers seem to have a plan before they get in the water or before they go to a particular site to take a photograph. So I wonder, where do you draw your inspiration from before you go and do that recording? Or are you, like me, just go and find, wing it, <laughs> winging a prayer? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, at the moment, because I haven't done much underwater stuff, so that's, yeah, that's definitely what I've been doing. Underwater, I just kind of go in and see what happens. Yeah. But when I'm filming with college and whatever, I, I do have to, like, we have to plan so much before we actually get to go out and film. But what actually got me into wanting to do, because I want to do, like, wildlife photography and whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What got me into that was really specific. It was, I watched the BBC documentary when I was about seven or eight I think about penguins right. <laughs> and after that they just became my favorite animal and I thought from then on that is what I want to do I want to end up filming them so that is kind of my end goal yeah to get to that level where I sit there and get to film penguins and then get to go under icebergs and whatever mm -hmm. definitely what I want to do <laughs> icebergs the, the, you know what intrigues me with them the noise apparently they're yeah. dead noisy and yeah, that's it's strange because they move like all the time apparently, mm. and it's a bit scary. But <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm still like that about cave diving. I I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not claustrophobic, but the idea of getting just trapped in something like a little tight restriction or something for me is yeah. You know, where you just can't turn around, but your mates can't pull you out. I've yeah, solved that. There's, yeah, I. it's difficult because I, I want to do it just because they look so cool. Mm -hmm. Like, I would love to see the inside of a cave, but I'm not too big on the idea of... No. Like, I'm not, again, like you said, I'm not claustrophobic either, but I, mm -hmm. I would want to be 100% confident in my diving like yeah. abilities before I went and did any cave tra training or whatever. We've, we've booked to go to Mexico at the beginning of December. Um, or we did oh, we, right. ha we have booked and paid for the whole lot of it yeah um, in fact we're supposed to be out to Croatia in a fortnight doing a documentary for that <laughs> out there but oh, well. don't think that's going we just had our flights cancelled anyway but so we're going to do yeah. a we're going to do cavern diving while we're there clearly oh, not yeah. being cave trained you can't do much more than a cavern but that'll either mm -hmm. sow that seed 
for us both. I think Ali's probably more frightened than I am. Um, mm -hmm. But again, I don't, I don't really see the point in spending the money to do the training if I don't live anywhere and I'm not going to be doing that regularly well, enough. Yeah. If it's just once a year on a holiday, I reckon a cavern dive when we're, when we're there would probably be enough, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I did... Um... Yeah, it must have been like four years ago. I did cavern diving in Florida. Wow. And it was like, that was amazing. Yeah. Um, I did because I was also doing my rescue training at that point as well. Yeah. So I just remember like doing the training in places like Devil's Den and Blue Grotto and whatever. And I'd seen them on YouTube. I'd looked at them a hundred times because they just look so cool and the water is crystal clear and whatever um but yeah definitely <laughs> they have them signs that say like beware don't go any further if you're not there's nothing worth whatever. worth dying past this sign <laughs> <laughs> yeah with yeah. the grim reaper on it and whatever yeah, yeah um and i just remember like thinking eh, it would be cool to see, mm. <laughs> to see that bit but yeah i'm not i'm still not sure still not sure if i'll risk it no i think for me not that i learn enough about every wreck that i've dived on but wreck diving still still 100% floats my boat. <laughs> no pun intended, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> yeah. you know, there's a lot to learn about them. Isn't there? Even like where Gary had been over in Newfoundland, there's all them wrecks there that are pristine, sat bolt upright yeah. in crystal clear water, but it's four degrees. Mm. Mm -hmm. I fancy that for a holiday, but I'd love to go. <laughs> and I'd oh, yeah, probably love yeah. to do that over just one cavern dive. Just go and see four beautiful wrecks. Oh yeah. Mm. I mean, that's definitely, odd. That's, Newfoundland is on my bucket list. Yeah. And I'm trying to convince, I know Canada's a big place, but we're supposed to go to Canada next year, probably. Yeah. And I'm trying to convince my mum to let us go there. Um, but, yeah, it is going to be, it's very cold, though. Mm, there's so I much to dive in there in the world. You just... <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm lucky that my wife dives, because otherwise I probably wouldn't dive as much, you know, because we every holiday we go on, we tend to at least do our dive, if not it be a diving holiday. So mm -hmm. mm, pretty lucky there. But so um is there anyone you want to say hello to, thank you to, or mention anyone like that? I mean, firstly, I think I would like to say thank you for you to having me. Thank you. Very um much. and You're then welcome. I just wanna I mean my dive club, Ocean Diver. Um, I just wanna say thank you because the woman that runs it, Maurice, she's great. And yeah. um also, canary divers up in Hull, more up your way. I don't know. If yeah, that's yeah, it is. Near where you live. we're we're um, on on the west coast. They're on the east, but yeah. Right. Yeah, but um, yeah, both of them clubs have got massive youth sections in them, and they're doing such good work to try and get more kids into it. And I just think it's such a great thing. Yeah. So yeah, those are my two shout outs. I think. Nice one. So what are you, what are you doing for the rest of the day besides drinking um, what what effectively is warm <laughs> juice? It's not even a brew. What you're drinking is it? <laughs> No, um, I might go out on my skateboard later. I'm not sure. That's something that that's something new that I've got into during over lockdown. Skateboarding, <laughs> not very good, but keeps exercise up. <laughs> yeah, nice. About twenty odd <laughs> degrees in it. It's a nice day. Yeah, it's nice. Well, so thanks for coming, mate. I, I do appreciate it, um, and and hopefully at some point somewhere we might hook up for a dive. <laughs> Yes, perhaps, that would be really good. Perhaps yeah. not as likely because you're over in the southeast and I'm over in the northwest, but you never know. If... You never know. Yeah, yeah. you never know. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. enjoy the rest of your lockdown. Hopefully it's not going to be too much yes. longer before you, you can get actually in a local dive site rather than just being able to dive off the <laughs> uh, off the coast that's pretty crap yeah. where I live. And I, is it crap where you are? How far are you from um, the coast? Not too far. We're actually really lucky. Um, we've got quite a local one it's only about two hours drive i think so it's not yeah. you can do it in a day easy yeah um called celsi and that's right. normally it's quite nice but you normally have to go out on a boat right so it's not really shore diving no. you can make it shore dives but they're just not as good no well our two hours away is north wales which is still on full-on lockdown as far as i'm aware so i can't go yeah. anywhere so i can no. snorkel in that river that's brown <laughs> <laughs> may, as well get me, may as well get me paddling pool in my back garden again. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> See you later, mate. So that brings us to an end of episode seven with my friend Scuba Grace Westgarth. Links to all the things we discussed will be in the podcast notes. My guest on episode eight is Fernando Chris, 
as a self-proclaimed shark diver and activist for shark education and conservation. I first met Fernando in Fort Aventura in 2016, where he taught me about the angel shark, Squatina Squatina. Originally from Portugal, Fernando has lived in the Canary Islands for the last decade, not only working with children in schools, divers at dive centres, but also interacting with the European Union to help raise awareness and education and trying to stop shark finning practices. You've been listening to Are You A Scuba Diver? Fancy A Brew with me, Andy the Northern Diver. You can find more episodes of scuba related content on my YouTube channel. A link will be in the podcast notes. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and consider leaving us a five star review. If there's someone or something you'd like on the show, then let us know via the Facebook page that's in the podcast notes. Thanks again. See you on next one.